Okay. Um, so I think it's a it's a great pressure today to have our, our first book of the year in the series of recent or new publications of uh, contemporary thought that we organize at the 17 Instituto de Estudios Críticos in Mexico. And uh, the book that we have for today is a book that um, I think is an extremely important contribution uh, greater, of great originality. Uh, it's a book that has been long in the making, um, but it was published finally last year. Uh, it's The Politics of Immortality in Rosenweig, Bart, uh, Karl Barth, and Goldberg by Theology and Resistance between 1914 and 45 mm -hmm. by the, the scholar Martin B. York. This is the, the book published by uh, Bloomsbury. And this is a book that studies, I don't want to say too much because we have wonderful commentators for today's session, uh, but this is the book that uh, studies uh, three important figures, just mainly in theology and philosophical political discussion during the interwar years in Germany, uh, but confronts their, their constellation and their um, thought against uh, a certain biopolitical and Darwinist reduction of life uh, to, to confront the big uh, thesis regarding modernization and, and the Bloom, uh, Blumenberg definition of uh, human self-affirmation or self-assertion uh, in which I think today one can also find a certain collapse or um, exhaustion of the modern epochality. So I think this book, beyond its academic sort of scope and framework uh, in German studies, in the theological register, is of an immense importance, I think, in order or for anyone interested in biopolitics, uh, the, the crisis of modern or the critique of production and civilization. Uh, and, and like I said, I think we, we are uh, very lucky to have two great participants today who will comment on the book. Well, aside from the author today, who's, who's here with us, uh, Martin B. York, first of all, thank you. Uh, he currently is a scholar and researcher at the University of Lund um, in the theology and religious uh, department. Um, we have as, as our first commentator, uh, Professor Peter Pham from Northwestern University. As we know, Professor Femme has written extensively on German uh, modern philosophy, Walter Benjamin, and the German tradition. And uh, lastly, we have also um, a colleague who has been in other sessions with us, um, Philippe Tofanidis, in, uh, who teaches at York University in the Department, department of Communication. Um, so thank you all, the three of you. And with this, I want to say more, um, and I will uh, have the first intervention as usual. Uh, we have the first interventions, then a reaction from the author, and then we'll move along with the discussion. I don't know who, who would like to start, either Peter or Philippe. I don't mind, uh, Peter, if you don't mind, I can go ahead. I'm sure um, your That's point fine. would be okay. Perfect. Um, yeah. Even before we start the discussion, I want to further highlight some of the points made by Gerardo, and I can simply point that I'm coming from communication studies, not necessarily from political science or from uh, theology. I can also say. Um, half jokingly that I'm a pagan, that is, I don't have any religious background or anything. So the question was a genuine and honest question for me when Gerardo made the suggestion and, and told me it, it started a long time ago with the uh, essay in EndNotes, we'll come back to that. He told me, look at the book, it's interesting. At first sight, it's, it's strange because it seems to me that I'm invited to step into a, a super specialized field. Um, but I can say <laughs> having went through the whole thing that actually it's, it's of, I think it's even more interesting outside of the field of, of theology. So I'm highlighting the fact that even if you're not specifically interested in religious studies, 
if you are at, at the tiny least interested in the ongoing crisis, be it climate crisis, be it racism, be it uh, the, the resurgence of nationalism, and of course, capitalism, all of these topics are of, of high relevance in the book and they are covered explicitly in the books. So I think that it's, it's simply a way for me to flag the interest of the book outside the circle of uh, specialized uh, study. Of course, the book also makes, and we can talk about it, makes a series of highly original contribution. The most obvious one is to is to the way uh, Martin triangulate the work of Rosenzweig, Bark, and uh, Goldberg, which has not been done before, at least not in this level of depth, because there is a really close reading of primary material throughout the whole book. And the other aspect, maybe a detail, but it was a striking one for me, and hopefully maybe we can uh, come back to that point, Adolf Kaspery, a complete discovery for me, and I tried to do some research, and it seems to be really not well known, but of high relevance, especially uh, if we are trying to understand the way capitalism intersects, for instance, with technology. Technology is also a, a topic in the book. Uh, so all of this from afar is enough for me to try to show the uh, not only the relevance, scholarly relevance, but the interest of the books for uh, anyone interested in what's going on in the world right now. There is a couple of topics, I think, they are wide topic. I'm not making any specific question, although we could go into many details because the book is quite detailed. I'm trying simply to outline general topics that we could, we could further develop or try to unfold uh, for the general public. At some point in the book, I thought this book should be titled The Book of Transformation. Because each chapter, each one of the theologians, they are really interested not in being satisfied with the status quo or of how things are, but they are really looking to try to change things, hopefully for the better. We'll get back to Sine and Solon at some point, what is and what should be. So it's all a book about transformation. And if we want to want to be a little bit more specific, not any kind of transformation, at the horizon of all this, there is something maybe we could also name revolution or radical transformation. So that would be one thing. Um, related to that, about this transformation, maybe one of the obvious um, topic, because it's on the cover, aside from, as Gerardo mentioned, immortality, which should be understood by the reader basically as a contemporary discussion on biopolitics, because that's what is in, at stake in this discussion on immortality. But the other word on the cover of the book is the word politics. So something there is something super interesting in all three main chapter, one chapter per main author, Rosenberg, Barth, and uh, Goldberg, one thing that is interesting is the way they struggle with political forms, and more specifically, political collective forms. In Rosenzweig, for instance, when he described Judaism, he seems to be more inclined to leave behind political completely. It's not exactly the case with Barth and with Goldberg. Both of them seems to define their own effort as a political effort. So that's a discussion we could have. What do we do with the politics? Do we try to reform the political or do we try to leave it behind as post-foundational politics uh, text of the recent years I've tried to do? Um, one other interesting ax um, aspect, it's a more general and maybe more philosophical, but it's also more fundamental. It's the way each and every time, it's also a problem in communication, how do individual parts, and we can think about individualism, for example, it's not abstract, it's the way we are all separated. How can individual parts eventually relate with one another in order so something bigger comes up, right? In, it's, sometimes we will refer to emer, emergence, right? The, the sum is bigger than the total of the parts together. This problem, how beings, existing beings relate with one another to create something bigger and eventually from a theological perspective to relate to being to the absolute total and temporal being this is an interesting 
question. This it's not only a religious question; it's also an ontological question already present in Aristotle, but also for us today, absolutely immediately a political problem. How can we live together in an harmonious way, or at least in a way that works? It seems that our society basically is a management management of separation more than in anything else. And this needs to connect together, clearly marked the effort of all three main authors that are studied in this book. And I don't want to be um, too long. The last point maybe I wanted to um, raise that should be, there are many other points, but this one is also interesting. And I know it relates because we talked a little bit with Martin before. I know it relates to uh, Martin, a topic that you identified as a central one. You use the word imagination. And I remember flagging something early on in the book because it reminded me of a beautiful quote by Baudelaire who, who is used actually, the quote is used by Didier Huberman. And Baudelaire says, a scholar without imagination is half a scholar. So it, he's doing something inter interesting because in, academ in academia, usually we think that there is science on one hand, and then there are folks doing poetry and art on the other hand, and the artistic people are the one doing imagination. That is to say that commonly, we disconnect imagination and reality. In the same way, maybe also very commonly, we tend to, but it's problematic, we tend to disconnect the virtual from the real. It's a problem if we go back to Deleuze, for instance. I'm saying all of this because even if we don't talk about imagination, something that runs through the whole book each and every time in these discussion about how can we transform what is into what could be, it's a relation between what is actual and the realm of potential or the realm of possibility. That's how I read, Martin, the way you flagged imagination as an important concept, the capacity to envision possibilities that do not belong to the present, but not as a way to flee out of reality, but as a way to actually realize a new realm or a new state, uh, a, new, a new status quo or a new state of the world. So uh, big topics, but I think they weaved in and they run through the whole book. Most likely we can simply unfold uh, on some of them. And with that, I can turn around and leave the floor to uh, Peter. Uh, thank you for that. that There's much to think about in what you're saying and, and an enormous amount to think about with respect to, uh, to Martin's book. Um, so I'm going to start by saying that I'm, I, I'm probably approaching this book from a, almost the opposite uh, point of view, which is one of my interests is in the German writings uh, in the 1920s, just, just after the First World War, the collapse of Weimar, of the, of the Wilhelmite Germany and the emergence of Weimar Germany, uh, which was a shock, the first democratic, German states uh, and um, and it was uh, it, it, there's much to say about the response to that even in a couple of years from 1918 to 19 the early 1920s uh, there, there was an immensely rich field of reflection uh, within the space of German writings in that period, and that attracted me for a very long time, which is the reason why I, in fact, uh, had wanted to read uh, Martin's book when it's described to me, because what Martin is doing, what Martin has done, is identify something that is often missing, a very essential part of the discussions of what was happening. The discussions, I call it discussions as, as if it were discussions. These are polemic. There's a very, this, is a, this is an area that did was the, incub the incubation of a radical reflect re transformation of the idea of life with a political party, namely the Nazi party, uh, which is happening as these writers are working. I, I wanna emphasize that. Um, and it cannot be forgotten that a thinking of life, of what's worthy to live, uh, is a thinking isn't the right word, a certain kind of demonstration of it uh, uh, is contemporary with the writings that, that Martin is examining 
And the constellation, to use Benjamin's famous term, it's not only Benjamin, it's many other people who are using it at this period as well, but the constellation of figures that Martin is producing here is, for one thing, the one thing it's, it's unique. I know of no one else who has done anything like this. Uh, he's taken figures who are very, very firmly uh, uh, established in certain disciplines, so much so that they're deeply protected by the ones who want to uh, who, who defend them. One certain kind of Christian theology, another a kind of Jewish philosophy. I'm going to say as a footnote, Bolzenzweig is often seen as the first Jewish philosopher since Maimonides, so about 800 years between the last and the, the last great Jew, uh, Jewish philosopher, an Aristotelian one, and here a, a German idealist one. Um, and a figure who, with a very small exception, is not that well known outside the German-speaking world and not so much in the German-speaking world either, which is Goldberg, uh, enormously rich, very important writer who had a lot to do with what was happening in the 19, uh, certain elements of the 1920s uh, through a number of his disciples, but also in his own writings. And he's putting these, these figures together and more is happening by putting these figures together than would otherwise be having, otherwise happen in three individual monographs. And I'm going to just say what I think is happening, and it's deeply relevant to today because there, is a, all, there are these resonances between the 1920s in certain parts of Europe and the, and the 2020s around the world from Latin America through the United the States and on through Europe. Um, what's happening, what he, ha, here is, and I'm, I'm going to, what, what, what's here is, is a reflection on, but a reflection isn't the right word. Uh, a, uh, a, a certain involvement with the notion of life. And one of the things, I'm gonna be a little bit polemical here in my own case, one of the wonderful things that Martin is doing in this book by emphasizing this, I, the, uh, the key term in the title, eternal, is taking the debate about life outside the sphere the, of discussion circumscribed by the, by the term biopolitics as it originated in Foucault and was continued through Giorgio, my friend, Giorgio Gambe. Um, and I'll, let me give you a, a note about how this works. Why Martin's book is a very good, uh, I would say complement or corrective or reflection on what Giorgio did with uh, the notion of biopolitics in its origination in Foucault. So here's the thing. Giorgio took a term that was very present in the early years of the, the Weimar Republic, bloßes Leben, mere life, a term developed by this man named Rickert, Heinrich Rickert, who was a teacher of Heidegger and Benjamin at the same time, as a matter of fact. Uh, and he wrote a very important book of this period, long forgotten for good reason, called The Philosophy of Life, in which he distinguished bloßes Leben from complete life, mere life from completed life. Well, some of his students, including Heidegger, Rosenzweig, and Benjamin, all of whom were students of Rekek, did not agree with the counter concept of bloßes Leben being vollendetes Leben or completed life, sorry to use German. And they all in their own way invented, let's say conceived of a version of, of the counter to mere life as eternal life. Benjamin uses this term, Rosenzweig uses it really centrally and Heidegger does too in his own way, even, in, even, even he, he distances it from the term, the classical notion of, of avic kind of eternality. So, and this is, but Giorgio, so far as I know, never once mentions the concept of eternal life as the counter concept to mere life. That's the one, the one hand. So we have here a powerful reflection on Martin's part of a conception of life, which is not mere, 
but it's also not, I want to put this like, it's not the conception of life to be used or useful life, you, that's not the right, used life that Giorgio ends Homo sac, the, the volumes of Homo Sacco with. Uh, closely related to Aristotle, who's a really important figure in this for all of these in their, his own way. And that's on the one side. The other really deep reason for the emphasis, in my view, a very powerful reason for the emphasis on eternal life as a key element of any political thinking of life within this period and within everything that it spawned, so to speak, in our contemporary discourse is that the invention of bio, the term biopolitics, not biopolitics, but the invention of the term biopolitics in Foucault Con is conceived around a term, a, a, a phrase, which as I hear it in French and I use it in English and I hear it translated into German, does not make sense. The term is make live. That's in contrast to for the former version of sovereignty in which letting live and making die. That's what the sovereign did, but the new biopolitics sovereign is making live. But living is never making. There's no making living. It, the phrase doesn't mean anything, or better yet, it means everything. And eternal life is not made. It has no constructive principle. And this is what unites these figures, that they know that life is never, ever made. It can't be made, and it can't even be conceivably made. So there is no biopolitics. There's just fake biopolitics because life is never made. It happens. And of course, the, the issue around this is how it happens, where it happens, and and the communality, uh, and using uh, Philippe's uh, term, that, that, that's, the, that's the key element, is how it happens in, I mean, this is Nancy language, right? how it happens in common, because it's always only happening in common. It never happens alone. Uh, and I see, again, Martin's book, in the broadest sense, as a magnificent corrective to something that is just missing, and it's probably missing, because of a certain misunderstanding of secularity, which takes, which is really how the book starts out and is set up with respect to Blumenberg and, and, uh, and, and actually just the broader question of what it is, what is modernity such that something like the term biopolitics would even make sense. And the answer to that is life seems to be, a, is, life is pretends to be made constructed cell, you know, creating oneself, creating one, all of these other ways in which it, the constructivity of life can be imagined. Um, but that's not real. Life is never really made or it's not life. And I see that as the uniting principle, so to speak, of the three figures. And I see no other work of scholarship that does so effectively makes this point by having it so deeply rooted in very, very different thoughts. Okay, uh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Peter and Philippe uh, for those wonderful commentaries. I think they open a lot of um, important routes that we can that we can take in relation to to um, to the stakes in the book, but I'll I'll let uh, Martin uh, have a first stab or reaction to to the two comments. Yeah, thank you very much for these generous and fascinating comments and readings. It it makes me very happy and filled of new ideas. Um, but yeah, first, perhaps I, I would like to comment uh, what. I would like to call the something of uh, something like the circular the circularity of theology. That is, is it possible to read theological texts as texts about this life, about human life, about this world? And of course it is, I would argue. And I think that is something that perhaps has got lost in, in philosophy, uh, which is sad, of course, because. Classically, there has always been a relation between 
theology and philosophy. I mean, if you take the ancient period, Aristotle's metaphysics was a theology. It was a theory of wisdom or a theory of... The, the concept, the word theology, you know, the first, I mean, perhaps not the first, but one of the first cases where we find it is, is of course, in, in Plato's The Republic, and which ends, by the way, with the myth of air, that is a theory of the reincarnation of the soul. So the first classical book on, on politics or a utopia of sorts has a theology, and it implies a theology um, that is a description of, of the, the lives of the god, which the lives of the gods, which is from Plato's perspective, in a sense, the, the, the lives of, of the forms that, so to speak, determine political life. And what fascinates me with the Weimar period is that it's a period that we can reflect ourselves in, but it's also a period where thought had this deep relation still to the theological traditions. And I also come from, from a secular background and I, and, and I live in Sweden, which is a very secular country. And I think that theology fascinates me a lot because it describes a, a very strange world, but I think a world that is also quite close to us and can help us think about well, what theologians call the first and la the last things, prot you know, protology and eschatology. And so theology is, of course, it's as the word says, it's, it's, the, it's a thinking, a logos or a saying about God or the gods. And philosophy is, of course, always a conceptual thinking. It's related, we, we think through different forms of co concepts. They can be monads or substances and so forth. And theology is a form of symbolic thought that thinks through these, perhaps we can call them mythical uh, entities, namely gods or angels or demons and so forth. And there is, I would argue, one interesting difference perhaps between theology and, and um, philosophy, but that also links them together is that it's that if, the, if philosophy is, is born from wonder, as Aristotle and others said, I would argue with John Henry Newman, a um, Catholic theologian, that theology it not only begins with, with wonder, it also begins with dismay, namely a feeling that the world is not as it should be. And to me, th that's the strength of theology, and of course, it's it's danger. You know, there is you know, always a kind of danger in theological thought because it's often related to the description of how the world should be. You know, the world shouldn't be like this. It should be on an you know, it should be reconstructed, transformed. And when it came to these three thinkers, um, Franz Rosenzweig. Karl Barth and Oskar Goldberg. I was surprised when I started to work with them, mainly because I was very interested in, well, in German philosophy and, and German theology. But I saw that they were all, you know, I saw a pattern and the pattern was when they described eternal life or, or what they also called immortality, they were seeking to, to redefine what life is. And they did that, of course, in a period where the concept of life was turned to, it was politicized, it was increasingly turned to a concept that could be reduced to blut and boredom, uh, to, to the nation, to culture, to history, to, to the state. And theology for these thinkers became a way to describe life in another way and to resist that, that kind of reduction, even only, you know, or perhaps only conceptually. Yet by thinking in another way, they of course argued also that we have to live in another way. And as I said, with Plato, already with Plato, we had that classical um, link between politics of immortality, politics and immortality in his 
in his, you know, in the Republic, we have this theory of, of the reincarnation of the soul. That is that the political order has to be, has to think in, in relation to coming generations, to the future and to the past. Uh, so the political order has, has to think about coming generations and, and past, the past, past generations. And for these three thinkers, Rosenzweig, Barth, and Goldberg, who are, of course, well, two Jews and, and a Christian, they are, of course, anchored in, in what perhaps can be called the Abrahamic tradition, which conceptualizes eternal life as some kind of transformation and some kind of hope for the dead. Uh, that is a hope for a hope for, a hope for for salvation that is not only about my life it is rather the hope for the the oppressed the 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 destroyed life the the life that so to speak never got the chance and i'm not arguing of course i'm not arguing that that the theological thought in itself is it's radical or revolutionary or trans you know, transformational um, but for these three thinkers, it was. But it was it was that in 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 different ways, obviously. And I mean, and perhaps the most, so to speak, politically radical was probably Oscar Goldberg. Karl Barth was he was a social democrat, um, and Franz Rosenzweig was. I mean, he was. A, I would argue that he was a conservative, rather, but a conservative that hoped for that as you know as a German Jew I mean he died in 1929 so before the Nazis took power but he understood that uh, he, he understood the danger of, of the nation state and he hoped for a, multi, a multicultural empire he hoped for uh, a global order uh, that was multicultural and of course there is a deep dark side in his in in his work which I you know, write about his his uh, hostility against Islam, for instance, and so on. But so so there is also, and so I'm not saying I, you know, I'm not I'm I'm not endorsing, but I'm trying to describe different political ideas that are related to to the theology of 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 eternal life. And I agree, it, it, I mean, that's a very good title, actually, the Book of Transformation, because it is, uh, it is a book of transformations, it is, since it's linked to this wonder and dismay. And it's also very interesting, of course, that Peter takes up Foucault and, and even reads it uh, as a critique of, of uh, Agamben, in a, sense, in, in a sense. And I avoided uh, Agamben. I, uh, and I don't use Foucault so much. I use perhaps one book or so, just one quote, I think, or two or three quotes. And I wanted to, because I wanted to ground these thinkers in their own historical situation. And to me, it seems that, you know, you just look at one thinker that I, you know, that I perhaps could have used much more effect, you know, much more, which I don't use in the book, but perhaps I should have in order to, strengthen my argument actually is for instance Max Weber because for Weber politics was necessarily Darwinian I mean politics was politics and, and econ economy was grounded in in what he calls the struggle of man with man he wrote that capital accounting presupposes the struggle of man with man and for Weber the reason why he dismissed um, you know, the hopes for socialism and all that, and instead actually argued for a form of what he actually called a form of national socialism. That was something else than, than you know, the, the national socialism of, of, of the, the Nazis, but it was still a socialism of this, the nation, the state. He, because he thought that the nations were thrown into this Darwinian struggle, just like human life was, was thrown in this Darwinian struggle. And these thinkers, 
but also it's like Barton Goldberg, who experienced the First World War, and Barton and Goldberg survived the Second World War. For them, these horrors made it important to, to, to try to show the need for another conception of, of life, of, of human life, that is not destined to be this, this struggle. And that is why I really like what, what Peter is saying about eternal life as something that is not made. It's not, it's not a work. And of course, for, for Rosenzweig, this, I mean, his whole book is in a sense, that, that the book, uh, The Stern der Erlösung, The Star of Redemption, which he wrote at least partly during as a soldier at during the First World War. He, it is a book about the hope, uh, the hope for the Sabbath, the hope for a sabbatical completion of, of life, a form of rest. And of course, he, and that's also a relation to, once again, relation to theology and philosophy. He, he said that it was a Jewish book, but he's, as you know, we call it the Jewish book, but he also described it as a system of philosophy. And I think Pollock's reading of, of uh, Rosenzweig as a German idealist that wanted to, dis to defend a system of thought. That is actually something perhaps I should have I should have underlined that because that's also a link to Barth and to Goldberg because Goldberg wanted also to develop a system. That's something that Bruce Rosenstock has underlined in his beautiful and brilliant book on Goldberg uh, that 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 Goldberg tried to develop a whole system of, of philosophy based on potentiality. And of course, Barth, Karl Barth, the, the social democrat and, and Christian you know, Calvinist theologian, he became famous. I mean, we can tell about him because perhaps not. It's, yeah, the, yeah he, was, he, he was a social democrat. He was a, a unionist. He worked with... Uh, started to try to start unions with the with the workers in in when he worked as a pastor in Saffenville in in, in Switzerland, and then he wrote this book, uh, the, the, the the commentary to the Epistle to the Romans, and the second edition of that book it's called the, well the Roma brief for the, the Epistle to the Romans that became a huge a huge I mean everyone read that book, and and that book was. It was like a form of expressionist defense of, of, of the idea of a crisis. But, but for him, uh, Vince, Vincent, we hear you. So can you put your... Uh, um, but he tried to develop um, of that when he got... When he got uh, um, a job in Germany as, as a professor in, in systematics, um, in reformed systematics and reformed theology, he also wrote a system. And I think it's possible to read his theological system as a philosophy. So, and with that, I mean a kind of complete description of life and human life and the cosmos as something that that is grounded in, 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 in the problems of, of concrete existence, but, it's, but has this imaginative power of, of, uh, um, of, yeah, of, of giving us a, an idea of, of, some, of life that, that could be, of, uh, a life that could be something else than, than this struggle. Uh, so that is that is the yeah that that's the the main argument of the book, and then there are of course specific readings of their of their understandings of potentiality and the difference between solon and sign and what sh what should be and what is and and the relation between time and and eternal and also as Philip said on the relation between the ind individual and the, and the universal. Um, but perhaps I should stop now. Yeah. 
Mm, yeah, the, uh, very, very good, Martin, the, uh, excellent. And perhaps I just wanted to, to tie or um, put, on, put on the discussion two, two themes that I think um, were, were important, perhaps connected in both Philippe's and, and Peter's commentaries. Um, which, which are the following. Uh, the first one, uh, I think, at, at least for me, um, picking up on what Peter was saying in relation to, to your understanding of, uh, of a life outside life um, as a radicalization, also perhaps as a displacement of the, of the biopolitical inversion that is, that is in Agamben's work, I wanted to, to displace this, this emphasis to, to the problem of immanence. Uh, because, well, the, the question, if well elaborated, could take a long time. But towards the end of the book, in page 186, you said uh, something very, very important, it seems to me. You, you, you write that what Blu uh, Blumenberg described as the moralization of immortality was parallel with an immanentization and biolo biologization of life that in the period between uh, 1914 and 45 was politicized with catastrophic consequences. Uh, and of course, I'm also here, I, I remember, uh, I'm, or I'm reminded uh, of, of how it, Carl Schmitt also, right? A big figure during the Weimar period, during these years, right? The big defender of, um, of political mediation he also characterized in the concept of the political uh, the, 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 the um, uh, how can I call it? The accelerated moment of modernity as precisely the epoch of immanence, of immanenti immanentization, uh, of indirect powers. Uh, in a way, I Perhaps one could, could one say, perhaps following, that's, that's my first sort of point, could one say following Peter that Agamben, precisely Agamben, so dependent on Carl Schmitt, is also, at the end of the day, a thinker of immanence. I mean, he also wrote the essay on absolute immanence, right? That would be one question. And then the other thing that I wanted to pick up um, is what a word that, uh, that was a structurally interesting for um, Philippe's commentary, which is transformation. Um, of course, it's impossible here not to think of uh, the famous Marx 11 thesis, right, about transformation of the world. And so I just wanted to ask you a very broad question. Um, uh, to, to what extent, uh, to what extent Marxist, Marx, although this is a very complicated question, of course, right, but to what extent Marx, and, and of course, the Marxist tradition is also another tradition that uh, although uh, inverting Hegel, trying to work with the metaphysical tradition of German idealism, uh, end up being also a philosophy or dependent on a philosophy of history based on what you call a scarcity. Uh, and, and to this extent, Marxism or Marxist thinking was never able to think outside of what Postone in the past called equivalence. Right, which in your terms will be the um, um, well, the, the principle of scarcity, uh, but also a sort a sort of technification of the visible without never coming to terms with invisibility, with the unproductiveness, right? Uh, with what Agamben, I think here does does make sense what he calls the the, the inoperative or the sabbatical life. Um, but again, this is just a basically trying to connect two points, but um, feel free to um, to react in, in any way. Yeah, um, I can, perhaps I can start and, and then I would very much like to hear thoughts from, from Peter and, and Philip so, uh, about this and, well, other things that you want to say. Well, I think, yeah, it's really interesting there. And I think to me, it's clear that, well, first of all, Barth had Hermann Cohen, the neo-Kantian and also social democrat uh, philosopher as, as a teacher. Uh, and of course, Rosenzweig was very close to, uh, to Hermann Cohen. So one thing that I think, you know, difference Agamben from these three thinkers is that these thinkers, all of them, 
are quite close, I would argue, in the end, to the neo-Kantian tradition, especially to, of course, to Hermann Cohen. Um, and I think that Heidegger's thinking is, to me, there is a difference here um, in the sense that he, he is perhaps the, the thinker par excellence on, on immanence in a sense. That is, that is that that life is is first and foremost this life in relation to to death. You know, it's a sign sum toda. It's a being towards death. Of course, these thinkers also, as I show in the book, at least Rosenzweig and Barth, they have you know uh, a quite you know sometimes quite problematic view on on on, on death. I would argue, uh, whereas Goldberg. Has a you know he has a uh, that's a chapter on on its own his his view on on death, but in the end I think there is a quite big difference between uh, there is a, an opposition in the end uh, between between these three thinkers and uh, the Heideggerian uh, science and some toward and perhaps there also difference with Agamben, um, since for all of them life has this relation to exactly what Peter called the eternal. And this is, of course, a theological speculation. So this is a form of axiom that they can, that they start thinking from, where, where all of them in the end argue that, and this is, this, is, yeah, this is a theological speculation which says that the past has not disappeared into nothingness. The past has a form of existence. That is, that which has been is not gone. It, it is not gone in, in, into nothingness. It, is, it has entered what they all describe as, as the eternal. So life in time is a form of participation in, in the totality of existence, the, the, the eternal, uh, the sum of, of what is, but also the sum of what could be. So for them, I would argue that life has this relation not to nothingness, but to the eternal. And once again, this is, of course, it's a theological axiom of, of sorts that, that come from the fact that they are all working with the Abrahamic traditions. And that is a difference to, to Heidegger. And I would argue that, you know, this is perhaps you know uh, work for a future book or so. But it seems to me that the Neo-Kantian tradition has that knowledge. It has that knowledge of 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 the difference of uh, time and eternal, uh, and the knowledge of what is and what could be. For 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 Cohen, that is you know that is explicit. He links Kant to to Plato and to the tradition of the prophets. And even, you know, it seems to me that Goldberg, of course, Goldberg and Rosenzweig tried to criticize Cohen and, and move beyond him. And Barth was also criticizing Cohen and especially his main teacher, Wilhelm Hermann, who was a Christian Neo-Kantian uh, theologian. And these the generation of, of neo-Kantians, I mean, many of them were social democrats, and many of them were also German patriots that supported the, the First World War, which was which was a shock for Karl Barth. For him, that was that implied a crisis both for the social dem democracy that he identified with and the Christianity that he identified with. So that implied that he tried to develop a new form of political theology. Rosenzweig, on the other hand, he was, you know, he was a warrior. He was a soldier. He had hoped for a German victory over the war in, in the First World War. He, he hoped that Germany could build what he called the, the Mitteleuropa you know, with Friedrich Naumann, a kind of multicultural Germany. Or, a, you know, he, he hoped for a European federation with Germany at, as it had. Whereas Goldberg, yeah, he has a whole theory of flight, of escape, and of, of fleeing the Western world, in a sense. So that's, I think, there is, uh, you know, and as far as I know, Agamben has never worked with, you know, uh, Goldberg or Unger and uh, this very forgotten figure, Adolf Kaspari. And perhaps it's coincidence, but perhaps there is also 
something there that that uh, it's quite different to to the Heideggerianism. That uh, yeah. Lastly, I would like, there is a book by Erik Unger, Wirklichkeit, Mythos, Erkenntnis, which ends with uh, a critique of Heidegger from and a defense of Goldberg. So Goldberg as a as a kind of anti-Heideggerian thinker. Yeah. Okay, so there were some points. I don't know if, if Peter and Philip would like to. If, yeah, I can make general comments again, and I will. Um, I liked uh, Peter's passion about <laughs> life is not made, so hopefully we can hear more about this. Um, I think maybe Heidegger. A detail but an important detail in the book coming as an outsider one of the things that absolutely struck me at least through the first chapter was I felt that every pages was haunted by Heidegger actually to the point I went online and I tried to find this anyone tried to connect both and of course then I discovered Gordon the book uh, between Rosenberg and, and Heidegger um, one, of, one of the things I think is useful as we walk through the book, and, and I'm pointing that because it relates to Heidegger in terms of method, at least, if I can put it that way. Of course, there is a huge difference between Rosenzweig and Heidegger, the most obvious one I don't even need to say, but I think there's also points of contact. I had the feeling that despite everything that separates them, they were working on something similar in a way, and it was really striking. So for instance, as we go through the book, I think it's useful to drop the idea. And at some point, I remember, I think it's Will Carr Barth, it becomes explicit. We need to drop the idea. Again, it's almost common sense, a common understanding of the contradiction or opposition between life and death. That's usually how we understand things, right? Life opposes death. And it's not exactly like that. It's not exactly that perspective that those theologians are taking. They are saying, no, actually, this death is a condition of possibility for life to happen in the first place. And this method, again, of revisiting a traditional opposition you find it everywhere in, in Heidegger. For instance, a, a misconception with Heidegger is the idea that he opposes the authentic with the inauthentic, which is not the case in Heidegger. He will say explicitly, and it, I'm saying this because it, it reproduced some of the wording in the first chapter. He will say authentic does not float above the tage from the inauthentic. On the opposite, the authentic takes place, almost as an event, takes place right at the inauthentic. And I felt that I found the same thing in Rosenzweig and at least to an extent in Goldberg, when they were saying there is no radical separation between the eternal and the temporal. On the contrary, they are linked together. They, one does not oppose the other, right? The existence of God, for instance, is precisely, if I want to put it like this, it's precisely the intersection of the ontological with the ontical, in a way. It's God becomes present, but while remaining eternal. And this makes me think, for instance, if we want to simply move this place this reflection about opposition, usually we tend to completely separate the potential and the actual. Something is in potential, it floats out there, and at some point it is realized, it is actualized. But usually what we understand from this process is that when a potential is actualized, it stopped being a, a potential. One of the contribution of Agamben, of course, was to show that the potential can actually actualize itself while remaining a potential, which becomes much more interesting. So the, simply a point I wanted to uh, make about, about the hunting of Heidegger in the book, but also a point of method about how traditional opposition are being reworked uh, through these three authors. And in a way, this resonates with Jean-Luc Nancy, Agamben, of course, and Heidegger and a couple of other uh, authors as well. I don't know, uh, Peter, if you want to pile on uh, some uh, some of these aspects. Uh, sure. Um, 
I'm happy to talk about this. I, I'm not sure of the time frame we're working with. So, uh, uh, Gerardo, can you explain how long are we going to be speaking? Because that would give me a sense of what to say. Yeah, we have about another 15 minutes or so. Okay. Well, I don't, I'll, I'll sit, speak for a few minutes. Uh, so I'm going to say this is a little bit provocative, but I, I think Heidegger is a latecomer. Uh, that Zeit and Sight is a late book, that it's the, the despite its originality and it's, I mean, that it's so-called originality and the degree to which it is a focal point for our reflections, rightfully, it's, it's a very important book. Zeit and Sight is a good book. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very much an absorption of materials, a, a, a creative absorption of materials which were available to him, starting with Husserl and, and Kant, uh, that is the re, re, some radical rethinking of Kant and Husserl and Aristotle. I mean, you go, which was of this period, he, he got the notion of Alatea from Natorp, uh, and uh, we don't have to, there, there, there are good books on this or some interesting books of this regard. Uh, and uh, that's that's one framework. And the other framework I'm just I'm not going to say is that of course uh, for me, uh, Walter Benjamin is an important figure here. He actually knew Rosenzweig and Goldberg at the same time, and he had a very complicated or to say he kept his distance from um, from Bot. He said he didn't know him. I believe him. Other writers have said that that's not true, which is to say that he lied when he wrote that he didn't know him. But, uh, and um, and and one of the things, what I, again, I, I want to uh, praise Martin. I mean, honestly, for it, Martin's book is interesting because it yes, there's resonance with all of this. There's resonance with Foucault, with uh, Georgia, I mean, with the Gamban, with Heidegger, with with Benjamin. But the concentration on figures who uh, two of them at least have a kind of have a have monuments monumentality around them. The other doesn't is. Uh, takes it out of some of the debates and gives us a new, new, new direction. But I think one of the new directions, which I'm going to re-emphasize in our discussion, uh, based on what Martin said about Sein Zin, Toda being towards death, is Sein Toda is a banality. Now, what Heidegger does with that banality is very interesting in specifically what he does with it. And above all, I'm going to say what the, the Tsu means in Sum Toda. Su in German means a lot of different things and it shouldn't just be translated as towards, but I'll leave that aside for some other kind of discussion. What's not a banality is the possibility, uh, that's a weak term, that life is only eternal. Any life that's not eternal is not alive. Now we generally conceive of life, but that's a conception that is deeply horizontal, has a horizon around it in relationship to separate beings that are in conflict with other life beings and with the environment which is not itself alive, uh, with a, an inert environment. But that conception is framed from is framed from the outside, that is from the outside of eternal life. Now that doesn't mean we know what eternal means. That is means not in the sense of having some kind of eternal referent, but where it could be understood that there be eternal life. And the wonderful thing about Martin's book is he's showing three different versions, not of imminence, but of what, uh, what Goldberg, who we've had very little to say about here, calls Israel. Now, Israel is a very complicated word. We don't know what it means. <laughs> and it's related to the word Hebrew. I mean, it's not stick. Hebrew for, gold, for, gold, for Goldberg literally means bridge passing over, transcendence in the, La that's just the Latin term. Well, what does transcendence mean? Who knows what it means to transcend, which is to say step beyond, right? Trans that's what transcend, that's what it means. And Hebrew is the version of stepping beyond and Israel does that stepping beyond. Now you call it Abrahamic. And of course we do that because we have to organize things. But Goldberg's version of what Abraham did is 
not equivalent to one might say uh, uh, into uh, the cognitive transcendence of the world as we understand it to be this inert play of forces. And what Goldberg was after was a certain kind of praxis, transformative practice related to the 11th uh, uh, thesis on Feuerbach, uh, a transformative practice that would instantiate a permanent Hebraism, that is a permanent bridge of each people with its own God because he understood Judaism as primarily not monotheistic, but monolatry, which is to say there's a one God for one people. But that doesn't, that's not a formula for war because the gods, the, the, the council of gods is a council of gods. And, and that council of gods is, a, is, a, is, is, is at peace with itself because of its counseling, counselary, counselary character. So this is a very interesting, extraordinarily powerful. Thomas Mann was, was transfixed by it, incidentally. Those of you who know some of Mann's novels, particularly Dr. Faustus. He was transfixed, and as well as the Joseph novels, he was transfixed by this vision that peoples or coordination of individual so-called lives is there only in its stepping over in its own Hebraicism. And each people has its own practice of Hebrewizing itself. And this is far different than Zayn Suntoda in its banal version, not to say that everything in Zayn and Sight is the banality of the, well, the banality of in, every individual facing his or her own death and trying to resolve to lead the life that is their own. In other words, Eigenlichkeit. Uh, but that is the banality that most readers carry with them from Zayn and Sight. And what Rosenzweig, what Rosenzweig does, what Bart does, and what, what, what I see uh, principally in this way, what, what Goldberg is doing is trying to think of this bridge, this, tra this, this transcendence as imminent, as only in praxis, as never something that is just thought independently of the life that's lived, and that life that's lived is not life towards death or life at death, tomb also means at, but life in its eternality, which is the only life there is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to both of you for these fascinating comments. And I think, yeah, Peter, you helped me explain the, the difference between the Heideggerian perspective and the perspective that I try to show that arises through through Rosenzweig, Barthes, and Goldberg's work with, with the concept of eternity and, and eternal life. And you, you mentioned Schmidt, Gerardo, and there is also a profound difference, I would argue, um, because if, if we take just three, you know, if, if first of all, for Rosenzweig, there is the hope for the globe. He's, he's hoping that the world will become global. He, he, he writes these very problematic but fascinating texts about during the First World War, when he fought as a soldier and hoped for um, this Mittel Europa, a, a form of European uh, national states, a kind of federation, a European federation, and that would you know, link the nation through wars. So he's not a pacifist, you know, he's often described as this wise man and the pacifist but he you know he is a dangerous thinking in, in in many ways but he hoped for a world state and that was of course schmidt's dread you know remember what he writes in 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 the concept of the political he argues that in a world which is a universe and not the multiverse in the world without which is a universe he argues there will be no theologians and no legal scholars <laughs> so there, there will be a world without Carl Schmitt. And it's interesting that Franz Rosenschweig hopes explicitly for what they call an Überwelt, not a Überman, you know, uh, not a Superman, but a super, super world, uh, which is Über Christlich und Über Judisch, it's even beyond Christianity and Judaism. And I try to show that perhaps there, there is a kind of you know, that we can read Rosenzweig against himself in a more productive 
uh, yeah, save him from his own uh, danger, you know, yeah, dangers or whatever we should call it. So for Rosenzweig, the concept of the world state, that is, you know, something that Schmidt could never accept, of course. Uh, that form of universality was, was for him. That was a, a destruction of politics. So perhaps you're right there, Philip, that there is a kind of attempt to flee politics, but actually through a kind of almost, not Hegelian, but still a kind of hope for universal history, you know, which is also fascinating that you have that concept, almost a Hegelian concept, I would argue, uh, in Rosenzweig, although he's very critical of Hegel at the same time. With Barth, I mean, Barth was explicitly an, an enemy to, to Carl Schmitt, of course, um, because Barth was, you know, he, he, he was kicked out uh, from, from Germany to his homeland, Switzerland, because he, well, he was, he was not following the, the orders of, of the new regime. And for him, it was essential that the church was an indirect power and in Schmidt's book on Le Leviathan, he is criticizing all indirect powers, you know, all powers that can, so to speak, uh, become something that, um, well, blocks the relation between the state and, and the, the people. You know, there, is, there should be a kind of link, you know, there should be the movement that links the, the state and the people but that movement had to be loyal to the state, whereas with the indirect powers, unions and, and churches and so forth, they, they, you know, they, they can undo the, the politics that Schmidt wanted. You know, for him, democracy was homogeneity. So it was identity. And of course, the whole point with, with, uh, with Barth's thinking is, is to argue that we can we are never identical with ourselves. We are split between this world and the next world, between uh, earth and heaven and so forth. Um, so the church for him was this indirect power. That was the whole point of, of the church. Uh, and then of course with Goldberg, and it's interesting because Schmidt wrote to Ernst Jr. that, you know, that he should read uh, Goldberg's book on Maimonides, and it's you know he, he makes these very anti-Semitic remarks that now oh, look this is this is Jewish Jewish thinking you know it's a, it's this thinking that seeks to uproot everything, and that was the point according to to you know the Hebrew experiment Israel, which for Goldberg was a universal task. It was not only a task for you know the the remnant of Israel, it was for everyone, although it was grounded in the experience of Abraham and so on. The that task was to ground, he argued that we could ground ourselves in life as such. And as Peter has been arguing, they viewed life as eternal. Uh, and of course, once again, that is, is, that is a form of postulate, you know, that is, that is a form of axiom that comes from, from the religious tradition. But it helped them to avoid the, yeah, the, the fascism that, of course, both Heidegger and, and Schmidt embraced and embraced openly and even defended, uh, at least partly in, in the part of their lives. And, and th that's also, I think, why there is work to be done in relation to the neo-Kantian you know, tradition, because it's interesting that they were really fascinating thinkers, and that they were also close to the to the German workers' movement. Of course, many of them, as I've said, you know, they Barth became, and many others, of course, became critical critical of them because they supported the First World War and so on. But it seems to me that there is some work to be done here, and to show that there are there are so many more in, interesting tradition traditions to discover. Um, yeah, like Goldberg and his thinking is still, you know, it's still something that we need to try to understand. And yeah, we talked about, you mentioned Adolf Gaspari and we don't have time to, to discuss him, but he, I mean, he wrote in 1927, a book called The Machine and Utopia, you know, the utopia of the machines, uh, which argues that socialism and capitalism are two forms of the same factory system. And 
Goldberg read his friend Kaspari as saying that these two systems, they are pushing us towards a kind of peak everything situation where oil and minerals and so forth are, you know, they will, yeah, we will not have, they are finite and we need to find another form of life. So there were even a kind of ecological uh, discussion going on here in the 20s, which also links the Weimar period to, to our times. So there's, yeah, there are so many fascinating thoughts. And I think, I think that theology gave them a kind of language to describe perhaps an impossible world, perhaps a world that never will come, but that gave them um, a way of resisting the madness that, that led to, to Nazism and, and to the Second World War and, and its violence and destruction. I wanted to make just a, a pun because I've, I've been thinking a lot about this while I was reading the book through the um, holidays and I was thinking there's so much to read and there's so little time and at some point I realized huh, that's the scarcity uh, Martin is talking about. <laughs> yeah, so, so I understand also existentially some of the topic of the book. Yeah, thank you, Martin. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's something we didn't discuss abundance and scarcity and Blumenberg and all that, but that's for another conversation. I think we have a few few minutes left before we we finish and we wrap it up. I guess I I cannot uh, leave the conversation without asking uh, this question, which is that, and in a way also. Um, affirming what Peter has said about the, the relevance of this, of this book, even though it is historically situated, the relevance of this book for the present, um, which is, and again, correct me if I'm wrong or, or if, you, if you see it completely different, but if, we, if our predicament today is a certain exhaustion of, um, of political modernity uh, towards a planetary unity, technification, the anthropology of capital, et cetera. Um, then we see a, a, a slaughter, like other, everyone has mentioned this, I believe, right? We, we see a, a return of, of, of certain uh, religious anthropology. Also, we see a return of uh, archaic sort of, I guess you would call it pseudo-theological um, positions, right? Um, what is interesting about the tradition that you tease out or that is common to, to the constellation of Goldberg, Rosenweig, and, and Bart, is that their theological commonality is neither in, I would say, is neither in the tradition of natural law, nor, about, nor in the history of salvation. I think Schmidt was in the second one, not, not necessarily natural law, right? But I mean, we have talked about it in recent years. We see, um, even in jurisprudence, right? We see a return of natural law in the wake precisely of positive jurisprudence, right? But the theology that UTs out radically, I think, confronts and destructs, right? The sort of, um, uh, well, let's say, the I don't want to call it political theology, but perhaps we, we could, the political theologies of domination of this life, as you would, you would call them, right? And, and so I, ha I had that to say to you. Um, is, this, is this a position that you would take? And if so, then um, I guess a question that would derive from this is the discussion on theology, right? Um, in the wake of the crisis of politics, of the categories of modernity, becomes a sort of demanding, a, a demanding task, right? A, a very important task to, to confront. It's really interesting that you say that because, of course, um, for Karl Barth, he, he developed explicitly uh, a critique of, of what's called natural theology, that is a theology that seeks to understand the divine through, through nature without the mediation of the scriptures or you know, Christ for him. Uh, he wrote famous book called Nine No against uh, Emil Brunner, a colleague, uh, which is explicitly a, a critique of, of uh, thinking that, that seeks to ground 
theology in nature. And he did that because, of course, uh, many of his colleagues in Germany, um, theological colleagues, had used um, natural theology in order to embrace Nazism, in order to legitimize Nazism. And there is a, a line in, 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 uh, in Latin in Die Werklichkeit der Ebrera, Goldberg's book, uh, that is very strong. It says that Israel was forced to live contra naturam vivere, to live against nature. They argued, and with that, I mean, he believed, all of them believed in the creator God. You know, all of them believed that is, they had, they had a notion of creation which is related, of course, to many other things that we have discussed uh, and the, the, the division between immanence and transcendence. And for them, that division implied that this world was only one world, you know, there is, there can be other. Uh, so conceptually, that, that distinction between a creation and a creator made them able to think about other kinds of world worlds. Uh, and that made them, you know, th that makes it, possible to view nature from not only as something beautiful, not only as something that is, you know, full of love and, and beauty and all that, which of course they underlined, but it's also, it's also a world of war, of violence, uh, of death. Um, so yeah, I mean, for, at least for, for Goldberg and, and Barth, there is um, a critique of, of the natural law traditions. Uh, but then, of course, you know, it all depends how you define law, it all depends how you define nature. And you know, in other ways, perhaps you could argue that there is some kind of attempt to think about, uh, to think, to think about the value of finite life. For, for Barth, for instance, I, I, I try to show that the finitude of, of human life is something that is related to the eternal for him. And he, he has a hope of a political order where, where the, sort of, so to speak, finite life can be liberated from the struggle of survival. And that is you know, the discussion on abundance and scarcity, which is very important in, in all of the chapters. But I don't think, think we have time to, to develop that, how eternal life for them is related to kind of economy of abundance rather than an economy of scarcity. scarcity. And of course, scarcity is related also to P Schmitt's thinking of the, en the enemy, you know, in a sense. So a world of abundance makes the enemy impossible. A very utopian claim, of course. Just, just to mention one common denominator in the two, in the two um, positions that I that I said regarding uh, regarding theology, a common denominator there is is the is original original sin, mm. and I would say that also in in the radical theology that you that that you reconstruct, they uh, they are anti original sin, right? Um, Original mm. sin is precisely, I think, what allowed for a sort of administration, administration of uh, of the reduction of life, of 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 the mediation between uh, goods and and life, and it's not it's not by coincidence, right? As Eric Nelson has shown recently, that the great political progressive thinker of the second half of the 20th century, John Rawls, uh, departs from a defense of original sin. That mm. later on informs his conception of the activist state, right? Of the mm. original position of the so of this of the new mediation for a for a new mm. social contract, mm. right? Um, so I find yeah. that intriguing and very important, right? That the the, the theology at stake uh, is precisely a theology that I don't know how you would put it, but I understood it as marginalizes the 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 problem the. the the apparatus, right? The dispositive mm -hmm. of original sin. It's very fascinating. I mean, that is, it's very good. There is no ori original sin in Goldberg. I mean, there's no fall. Uh, he has a whole fascinating theory about the human as, as um, a creation between the infinite and the finite. So, so for him, the, 
the problems, uh, the problem of evil is related to the fact that life as we know it is, is finite and hence it is related to all of the problems that, that is linked to finite life. And for him, there is this, well, the whole, well, the story in, 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 in the Pentateuch is, is, is on the Torah is about how the finite and the infinite merge and, and the infinite heals the world from the finitude of nature without abolishing its finitude. That's very speculative and theological discussion, but it's, it's not based, it's true that it's not based on original sin. Uh, when it comes to Bart, it's interesting because for him, there is a fall. Uh, there is some kind of, you know, he has this whole discussion of the problem of the human, the human as a kind of problem that needs to be, because the human has become, he argues, an ethical creature. That's, that's his reading, that humanity has fallen into the, the, to the order of ethics and the order of morality and the order of law, where we need to differentiate between what is good and bad. And we don't really don't know what it is. So for him, there is a kind of or, original thing in that sense. But you're still right, because the point for, for Barth is, is he has this stress on Christology that is, yeah, you know, the, the science of Christ, that is the science of the Messiah, the science of that is of, in the end, soteriology of, of the savior, of, of salvation. So in a sense, the world for him is already saved. So that is what he emphasizes a lot about laughter, comedy, uh, an attempt to th see through in, you know, in the madness of life. In, and of course, he, he survived two world wars and he picked you know, literally a fight with the Nazis. And you know, he, he, was quite, he was a very brave man. Uh, and I think you're right there that, it, that, that he seems to have had this strange feeling that the world already it was already saved in a, in a way it was already although you know with all of this violence and all of this yeah political dangers and yeah it was it was we had already moved beyond the the problem of evil that is why for instance in his church dogmatics when he writes about angels and demons he writes many 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 pages about angels and he writes few pages about demons <laughs> because he argues he makes a joke, joke that you know you shouldn't think about these things you know they because for him they were the powers of nothingness and he called them the shadow uh, and to think about nothing is in a sense to be to be caught in 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 this sin and 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 to believe that the world is doomed to um yeah doomed to destruction or whatever It's a very good point. Yeah. Excellent. I think we're coming to an end. I don't know if Philippe or Peter would like to add anything uh, to conclude or. Okay. So, uh, Martin. Just, uh, just thank you for oh, the um, the discussion was great. So thank you for okay. making the time and. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. This was a very very good discussion. Much to think about. Yeah, no, thank you again uh, to Professor Peter, Philippe, Martin uh, for well being here and discussing the book. And, and of course, the, from here now, I think everyone who will listen to, to this conversation will have to uh, acquire a copy of The Politics of Immortality, Rosenberg, Bart, and Goldberg, Theology it's and very, yeah. It's very expensive now, but in November this year, <laughs> it will yeah. come you know, as a paperback, and it's absurdly expensive at the moment. Well, maybe, it's a, maybe it's a good time to mention the fact, the existence of a modified version of the third chapter, which is available online for free in English, Spanish, and French. The chapter on Goldberg with all the material on Kaspari. So it's a highly, highly interesting chapter and a very good entry point uh, to the book. Thank you. Thank yeah, you for my sure. Yeah, and it could be ordered through through our uh, university libraries, right? Those who are in in such institutions. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, and this series will reconvene again in in February. <laughs>